Exodus chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Let me read that again. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. In 1980, the legendary Sidney Poitier directed a comedic film called Stir Crazy, which starred Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor as two prison inmates who had been sentenced to 125 years in prison after being framed for a bank robbery that they did not commit. After serving some of the sentence in a maximum security prison, the two of them joined forces with some other inmates to hatch a plan of escape because they had tired of serving life sentences for a crime that they did not commit. They were going stir crazy. After a host of antics, they successfully escape and are met with news that the real crooks who had committed the robbery had been captured. So for today's message, I'm going to adopt the title of that movie, Stir Crazy. Hashtag the original stay at home order. Reflecting back to my vocabulary courses that I took when I was in grade school, whenever we had to learn a new word, I remember that there were two things that were required of us. First, we had to look the word up in the dictionary. And second, we had to use the word in a sentence. So in practice, the exercise would go something like this. The Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines stir crazy as distraught because of prolonged confinement. Also in dictionary.com, stir crazy is defined as restless or frantic because of confinement, routine, or something on the like. And then when asked to use it in a sentence, the response might be something like this. We have been on house arrest for several weeks now. We have been on ankle monitors because of this coronavirus and the people are starting to go stir crazy. Today, the news is saturated with reports of people going stir crazy because of the stay at home orders and social distancing requirements. We want to go shopping, open the malls. Lord knows I need a haircut. Can I go to the barbershop? Would y'all please open up the gyms? Look at all this weight I've gained. We need to get out and get some fresh air. Open up the parks. I want to see my grandchildren. I'm going over to their houses anyway. If you don't let me open up my business, it will go under and I will lose everything. Stir crazy. And feeling the pressures of these complaints, many state and local governments against their better judgment are starting to relax many of the public health restrictions that were imposed in order to appease the people because we are going stir crazy. Meanwhile, 
because some local governments are not moving as quickly as folk would like to see them move. You have individuals and businesses alike protesting and rebelling. Recently, there was a report of a man who had entered into a store without a face mask. Now, he was approached by a clerk and the clerk asked him kindly to put on a face mask and he had the audacity to go up to her and start wiping his face on her sleeve. In Southern California, there was a small business that posted signs out front that stated, do not enter into this business with a face mask. And another sign said, hugging and touching are strongly encouraged. Up in Fremont, California, Tesla, the motor company, just ordered its workers back in spite of the fact that they cannot social distance and in spite of the governor's request that they remain closed until more safety measures are set in place. And now lawsuits are being filed and the court system is getting in the mix. Why? Because we are becoming stir crazy. Meanwhile, in the body of Christ, the stay at home and social distancing requirements present us with extraordinary challenges and rather precarious positioning because we know that we are in this world but we are not of this world. We know that we are sanctified. We know that we are protected. And accordingly, we know that we are not to be in fear. But even though we are sanctified and even though we are protected and even though we are not in fear, even though we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, and even though he will surely deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, we still have to submit to the governing authorities. Why? Because God said to do so. The Bible says in Romans, the 13th chapter, verses 1 and 2, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So from the perspective of the church, even though we are not in fear, and even though we are sanctified, and even though we know that he has given his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, and even though a thousand shall fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, we have to be subject to the governing authorities and recognize that the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And from what we can see in this passage of scripture, this stay at home notion, these stay at home type orders are not a new thing. And this is not the first time what we're going through today. This is not the first time that God's people were on lockdown. We see that there are a lot of similarities between what was going on then and what is happening today. And God had placed his people on house arrest even when they were back in Egypt, just like we are on lockdown today. Over in Exodus, the 12th chapter, verse 22, the Bible says, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. What are we talking about here? Stir crazy, the original stay at home order. So 
let's look at what you need to do since God has us on lockdown and since God has us on house arrest and since God's got us on an ankle monitor for the time being, let's look at some things that we need to do when God has you on an ankle monitor. Well, the Bible says over in Exodus, the 11th chapter, verse one through three, it says the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here all together. So when we look at what to do when God has you on an ankle monitor, number one is this. Look for the purpose of God in the situation. The first thing that you do when you recognize that God has an ankle monitor on you is you look for the purpose of God in this. Ask God to reveal what his agenda is to you. You want to make sure that you are not obstructing God's will. I don't care what is going on around you or how crazy things might seem. God is up to something. There is never any happenstance with God. There is no such thing as coincidence with God. Our God is never taken off guard. He has purpose. God has an agenda. God is at work. And you need to know that whatever it is, it is working together for your good. The Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So you want to make sure that you are in tune with him while he is working that thing out for you and for your good. The Bible says over in, Alexa, over in Exodus chapter 11, verse 2, it says, Speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So number two, when we try to figure out what to do when God has you on an ankle monitor, number two is to look for the blessing that God has in this situation for you. God has a blessing in store for you. One thing that is consistent about God that you will learn about him when you study the scripture and that you will learn about him as you walk with him for a while is that God has a track record for always bringing his people out of the trial in victory. There is always a blessing for God's people on the other side. So as long as you stay with him and as long as you trust him and as long as you walk with him and as long as you obey him and as long as you rest in the comfort that you belong to him and as long as you know that he belongs to you, glory to God, there is a blessing for you on the other side of this. There is victory for you on the other side of this. There is a testimony that is yours on the other side of this. Your healing might be on the other side of this. Your financial breakthrough might be right on the other side of this. Remember, Job came out of his trial with twice as much as he had when he went in. You got to look for your blessing. God's got a blessing for you in this. You need to open up your eyes and look for the blessing that God has in store for you on the other side of this. Over in verse four, over in Exodus 11, the scripture says this. Then Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the hand mill and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not known before, nor shall be like it 
again. Verse 7 says this, but against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move his tongue against man or beast that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. What to do when God has you on an ankle monitor? Well, number three is this. Look for the ways that God will sanctify you. Look for the ways that God will set you apart and make you distinct and distinguished from all the rest. The third thing that you've got to do is to look for the ways that God is going to demonstrate to all of the onlookers that you are sanctified. Look for how God is going to set you apart from all the naysayers. Look for how God is going to show you off to the doubters and unbelievers. Look for how God is going to deliver you and bring you through while everybody around you is dropping like flies. Expect God to let you pass through the waters and not be drowned because you are sanctified. Look for how God will let you go through the fire and not be burned all because you are sanctified. You've got a mark on you. You are well favored of God. You are precious and significant to him. Look for how God will make you stand out, how God will distinguish you, how God will set you on high. You are sanctified. Over in Exodus, the 12th chapter, verse 22 says this, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. What to do when God has you on an ankle monitor? Number four, look for the thing that God will require of you. Let me say that again. Look for the things, plural, that God will require of you. The scripture says over here in that 12th verse or 12th chapter, verses 22 and 23, he says, you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Last but not least, you have got to be on the lookout for whatever it is that God wants you to do in this thing. You will always have a role to play. You will always have a part to play. We are co-laborers together with Christ. There is never a time to sit back and do absolutely nothing. Talking about waiting on the Lord, like you're sitting at the bus stop waiting for the bus. God always requires us to do something. Why? Because faith without works is dead. So here in this passage of scripture, we see that God instructs his people to strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood of the lamb. We see that he issues a stay at home order and we see that he assures their protection and their safety so long as they do what he tells them to do. So here again, God makes a promise, which in this case is to protect his people from the destroyer. But the promise is conditioned on their obedience. Number one, they had to apply the blood to the lintel and the doorpost. And number two, they had to follow the stay at home order. Saints of God, we have got to understand that God's promises are always conditional. We always have a part to play. 
He always requires something of us. God will always test us to see whether we will obey him or not. So in our text, the Bible says that the destroyer was going to be dispatched that night and that the destroyer had been given an instruction which was to strike the Egyptians. But even though the target was to be the Egyptians and even though the people of God were sanctified and set apart, their very preservation was conditioned upon their obedience. They had to apply the blood to the lintel and the doorpost and they had to stay in the house. Now, if perchance anyone decided that he did not feel like applying the blood to the lintel and doorpost, or why did he, what is the point of this? Because I don't see the point of this. Or if he did not want to mess up his fresh paint job, or if he did not feel like it takes all of that, or if he would rather use Kool-Aid instead of blood, then that person would have removed himself from God's protective covering because the Bible said when God sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts that he would pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your house in order to strike you. Likewise, even though the target was to be the Egyptians and even though the people of God were sanctified and set apart their very preservation was conditioned upon their obedience. They had to stay in the house. Somebody might ask, why would they need to stay in the house? Weren't they sanctified? Yes. Weren't they set apart? Yes. Didn't God distinguish them from the Egyptians? Yes. Wasn't the target the Egyptians? Yes. Couldn't God protect them as easily in the streets as he could in the house? Yes. So then why would they have to stay in the house? Well, the answer is simple. The reason they had to stay in the house was because God said to. Remember, when God was sending the destroyers to take out Sodom and Gomorrah, what did he tell Lot? He said, get yourself, your wife, your daughters, your sons-in-law out of this city because if any remains in the city, they will be destroyed with the rest. Yes, God could have worked around them. And yes, God could have destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and built a gulf around Lot's family and household. And yes, God could have worked it out so that they would be kept while everything around them was consumed. But God told them to get out and God told them that they needed to escape. At first, he told them to go to the mountain. But after Lot begged him, God said, OK, you can go to the city of Zoar. And God told them to get out and to not look back. But the Bible says that the sons-in-law did not obey God. The sons-in-law did not get out. And as a result, the sons-in-law were consumed. And the Bible says that Lot's wife did not obey God. That Lot's wife looked back. And as a result, Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt. We are sanctified. We are protected. We are preserved, but we have a part to play and we've got to obey God. And God commanded us to submit to the governing authorities. So even though we are sanctified and even though we are protected and even though we are preserved, as long as the governing authorities tell us to stay in the house, we've got to stay in the house. If they tell us to wear a mask when we go outside, we've got to wear a mask when we go outside. If you are 65 or older and they tell you that there is a curfew that affects you, then you have to comply with that curfew. We are sanctified. We are protected. We are preserved, but we have got to obey the word of the Lord. 
but there is a blessing in our obedience. We've got to get this. We need to understand this because the Bible says that it came to pass that at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. The Bible says that there was not a house where there was not one who remained alive. In all of their households, somebody died. So if your house was not covered with the blood, if you did not obey God, then somebody in your house was shut that night. And before this, remember, Sarah had been playing games with Moses and taunting God and refusing to let God's people go. But after this showdown, he summoned Moses to the palace and told Moses to take God's people and whatever else y'all want and anything else y'all need and get up out of here. Please get what you want and go. And the Bible says that the Egyptians were so eager to get those folk out of there that they left them or let them have all their gold, their silver, their diamonds, their precious jewels, their and whatever else they wanted. The Bible says they plundered the Egyptians. So just like that, God transferred the wealth of Egypt into the hands of a bunch of folk who were slaves just yesterday. Do you know that's what God will do for you? You might be going stir crazy, but God can change your circumstances just like that. You can go to bed in chaos and wake up in peace. You can go to bed with sickness and disease all over your body and wake up with perfect health. You can go to bed in poverty and wake up looking like two chains you know that rapper 2 Chains? All God needs is for somebody to obey him. All God needs is for somebody to walk with him. All God needs is for somebody to submit to his word. Just like this, God can turn your morning into dancing. Just like this, God can change your circumstances. Just like this, God can turn it around for you. All God wants is for you to obey him. Hallelujah. Stir crazy. You might be stir crazy. You might be tired of staying at home, but that's all right. Do what God has instructed. Obey the word of God and watch God bring you out triumphantly and in victory. In Jesus' name, amen.